In a recent private conversation with CS and Stardusk, I offhandedly mentioned that nobody enjoys paying taxes. They were taken aback, both saying with not even a hint of irony that I thought you enjoyed paying taxes. I was more than a little shocked that they'd made this assumption. Uh, Put it this way, I like having teeth. That doesn't mean I enjoy paying the dentist. In fact, I don't enjoy spending time at the dental surgery at all. However, if you like your teeth and you want to keep them, dentistry, along with the physical pain and monetary cost associated with it, is an unfortunate necessity of good oral hygiene. Honestly, I enjoy paying taxes about as much as I enjoy having my fucking teeth drilled. But, you know, in the event that I do actually get run over by an unlicensed drunk driver like I was two years ago, it's nice that the universal healthcare system my taxes pay for stepped in and took care of me without the medical bills sending me into crippling debt for the rest of my life, all because of an accident ultimately beyond my individual control. I don't like paying taxes, but I do think the safety net those taxes pay for is an overall positive thing for society and the individuals in it. Basically, I was a little gobsmacked that they thought my position was that the act of actually giving money to the government is itself an enjoyable practice. Now, where I'm going with this is that if some of my close online friends whom I talk to privately several times a week can make such an egregiously incorrect assumption about my you know, personal position, uh, I suppose then it's unsurprising that people I don't know make some of the assumptions they do about me. In a recent response by Obsidian, uh, he brought up a few interesting points, but he also concluded that I was a one-trick pony who thinks the pill literally caused everything and claimed that my position was that the government would never do anything under any circumstances in favour of men, ever. And I know for a fact that he's not the only person who thinks this about me. Now, I guess I can see how he and others might get this impression given the specific focus of my content thus far, but my position is actually neither that narrow nor that rigid. Comments, even long comments, don't require a huge investment. So I understand some of the shit that I see in the comment section, but it's interesting that I'd have to point this out to a fellow content creator, um, particularly one like Obsidian, who literally started his own response video to me saying that he likes to keep things short so he wasn't able to address all the points I'd made. For the sake of time, clarity, and getting specific important points across, an awful lot of peripheral points end up on the cutting room floor. Any good writer will tell you, and I am not saying that's what I am, but any good writer will tell you that making a good argument isn't about blathering on endlessly, it's about brevity. It's about trying to make your points in the most succinct way possible. In other words, a good argument is as much about what you choose not to write. As it is, the bulk of this video is actually made of concepts that were originally part of my suffrage and enfranchisement video, but were ultimately cut for the sake of clarity and staying on topic. I mean, I think they're all interesting and important points, but in a video that had already blown out to over 50 minutes long, I felt that these points ultimately detracted from the specific concept that video was created to convey. The concept, of course, being that political suffrage and political enfranchisement are not directly interchangeable. Here's the bottom line about publishing an idea. You cannot discuss every issue all at once and still expect to get a succinct point across about a specific issue. Conversely, to the extent that you can try to discuss every issue all at once, you have to work in very broad strokes and make very large generalizations, which is fine, But in doing so, you have to accept that a lot of nuance will be lost in that explanation. What I'm getting at is that if certain points are absent in the final video, that doesn't necessarily mean they haven't been considered. It doesn't mean that I'm unaware of concepts like feedback loops, and it's not that I believe that the pill was some singular catch-all cause to the exclusion of all else. It's not that I'm ignorant of other important historical events that contributed to the society we have today. And finally, despite constantly being referred to as a defeatist, 
Or as one recent poet in the comment section put it, a stupid faggot cucked libtard apologist, I've said repeatedly that change is possible, just that I don't think that change is going to come on behalf of activism by a largely online movement that wider society considers a joke at best and at worst a misogynistic hate movement. That being the case, I want to use this video to give a slightly wider perspective on my position, a bigger picture of things, if you will, and hopefully in that context also give some insight about why I have tended to focus so much on specific topics like the pill in order to make my various points about both modern society and human nature in general, despite some of the wider societal influences which... I assure you I'm fully aware we're happening in the background. To start, I think we should take a brief stroll down the annuals of history uh, and review some of the major events of the last century, but I want to look at these events in a specific way, a way that probably isn't how they're taught in most 8th grade classrooms. Through the late 19th and early 20th century, the balance of power in Europe was in a rather precarious state. Mechanisation had fundamentally changed the face of the economy, not just in terms of farming and manufacturing, but also in the logistical transport of people and goods. Um, Even long distance communication, where correspondence that would have previously taken weeks of postage, could now be exchanged almost instantly via the electric telegram. After thousands of years of horse and cart, we went from the first steam engine to the steam train to personally owned motor cars and the first flight at Kitty Hawk in the historical blink of an eye. And in a desperate attempt to keep up with this sudden rapid progress, so many political and economic alliances had been formed and subsequently broken between closely neighbouring European nations that it was somewhat difficult to determine exactly who was on whose side and why. This spider web of tenuous alliances is really what set the preconditions for the war. In 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, a man that many people frankly didn't care for, was assassinated by Serbian rebels in Sarajevo, a region most Europeans frankly didn't care about. However, Because of these tenuous political alliances, the powerhouse nations of Europe fell like dominoes, one after the other, into conflict. This political cartoon of the day is a rather poignant illustration of how this event in a relatively minor nation ultimately dragged an entire Western continent into the most horrific conflict the world had ever seen, dubbed, at least until the outbreak of World War II, as The Great War. Upon the conclusion of this horrific four-year conflict leaving tens of millions dead, Germany was forced by France to sign the Treaty of Versailles, a humiliating set of crippling economic reparations, government restrictions, and the annexation of German land into a number of other neighbouring states, including France and Poland, which split East Prussia from the main body of Germany. In other words, more so than any other factor, It was actually the surrender conditions at the end of the war itself that set the preconditions for the rise of German fascism, the invasion of Poland, and ultimately the beginning of World War II. Already somewhat peripherally involved through the economic support of their allies and the intake of European, specifically Jewish refugees, the 1941 bombing of Pearl Harbor dragged the United States directly into the conflict ultimately joining the European theatre of war with the Second Sino-Japanese War, which was concurrently happening in Pacific East Asia, resulting in an intercontinental mechanised war, the likes of which had never been seen and thankfully hasn't been seen since. Now, much like the Treaty of Versailles, the conclusion of World War II with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki the Allied occupations and the Soviet division of East and West Germany is what ultimately set the preconditions for the subsequent Cold War, nuclear arms race, space race, Pacific Rim conflicts and so on. The ideological collapse of the Iron Curtain in the late 80s via the physical fall of the Berlin Wall continued this progression of events. This influx of poor Eastern Europeans from the former Soviet bloc back into the wealthy Western continent followed by the eventual reunification of Germany, 
is possibly what set the preconditions for many of the problems faced by the EU over the last two decades. The two primary complaints from EU citizens, at least from where I'm sitting here in Australia, seems to be that the Northwestern nations have for a long time now been economically carrying the Southern and Eastern nations, particularly as a result of the shared currency. When unstable countries like Greece fall to pieces, countries like Germany and France end up saddled with the cost. Secondly, on top of this direct fiscal support from one country to another at the national level, the free mobility agreement at the individual level has also allowed a flood of economic migrants to travel unimpeded across borders, basically flowing from these poorer nations into the wealthier ones. Now, even the events of 9-11 can ultimately be traced back to some of the various hot skirmishes which did in fact occur during this so-called Cold War. Without getting sidetracked by conspiracy theories that you know, Bin Laden himself was a personally trained CIA operative, it is undisputed that certain Middle Eastern militias were receiving direct and indirect support to fight occupying Soviet forces during the 1980s. Remember Rambo 3, the one where he goes to Afghanistan to help fight the commies? Yeah, that's basically the Taliban that he's fighting alongside in that movie. The Mujahideen, literally meaning those who are waging a jihad, was made up of a number of smaller militant Islamic groups, including one faction which would later become known as Al-Qaeda. During the Afghan-Soviet war, the Afghan Mujahid were funded and supplied with arms by the US to the tune of $600 million to fight the Red Menace. On top of that, they were also receiving sponsorship from Pakistan and the Saudis to the tune of an additional $600 million per year. It was a fairly well-funded little conflict. Now, this is a bit simplified, but basically, in the power vacuum left by the eventual 1988-89 to Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, this armed religious insurgency called the Mujahideen very quickly transitioned into an armed totalitarian theocracy called the Taliban. The two instigating superpowers involved in this Cold War never directly fought each other, but that's not to say that shots weren't indirectly fired. The US worked rather diligently behind the scenes to supplant the Soviet power base in this region with anyone else they could find, including extremist Islamic militants who were ultimately motivated by a fanatic religious jihad. Not the kind of people I'd want to put in charge, but what the fuck would I know? When the Iron Curtain eventually fell, the Americans and the Russians made up and started playing nice again, but they forgot or perhaps just didn't care about the insanely violent and well-funded theocratic regime they'd helped install into that little corner of the globe. When those Islamic chickens finally came home to roost a decade later in September of 2001, the US, along with their Western allies, found themselves dragged directly this time into a protracted 13-year armed occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq. To put into perspective what a spectacular shit show this conflict was, in an old video, CS mentioned that US forces fired approximately 50,000 rounds per confirmed kill in Vietnam. In the Iraq-Afghanistan conflict from 2001 to 2014, That figure was around 250,000 rounds per confirmed kill. It cost a lot of money, it took over a decade, and it achieved very little. We didn't defeat terrorism, we didn't stop a tin pot dictator from building weapons of mass destruction, and we certainly didn't bring democracy to the poor, oppressed peoples of wherever. Basically, it got to a point where we decided it just wasn't working out for us anymore. We pretended like we'd won, we gave ourselves a big old congratulatory pat on the back, and then we got the fuck out of there as quickly as our tanks could carry us. As you know, this of course led to a whole new power vacuum in the region and the rise of a whole new Islamic theocratic regime, hell-bent on even more violent jihad, the Islamic State. As the internal conflict in the region fueled by ISIS grew worse and worse, Refugees, as well as many economic migrants, began to flow from Syria through Turkey and into Europe. 
which due to the aforementioned free mobility agreements, has allowed no longer just poor Eastern Europeans, but now also individuals from third world conflict zones to flow across borders unchecked, bringing their quote unquote religion of peace with them. Islamic terror attacks are now becoming commonplace on the streets of Europe. Uh, Just in the last fortnight, we've had one guy in France run a truck through a Bastille Day parade and another guy on a German train attacking people with an axe, screaming, hello, snack bar. The atmosphere in Europe is tense and the response has been a rapid rise in European nationalism as well as a resurgence in political fascism and also white nationalism. Now, I'm not saying Brexit was primarily driven by fascism, but I think it's fair to say that all else being equal, it wouldn't have passed if it were not for the current European migration crisis. The combined effects of civil unrest in the neighbouring Middle East and the EU's open borders policy, both of which were set in motion decades prior, is starting to have a major impact on the Western European mindset. If the success of that British referendum is anything to go by, it could mean that we are actually starting to see the first loose threads of the EU completely coming apart at the seams. But ultimately, what we really see along this timeline is a very clear progression of major events, one seamlessly flowing into another, steering the industrialised Western world through the 20th and early 21st century as if on autopilot. The voting preferences of individual men and women along this timeline are largely irrelevant to the general direction that Western civilization has taken. The one possible exception here was the German people voting the NSDAP or Nazi party into power. However, I think there are some important considerations on that issue. The first being that, as I briefly mentioned already, it was the surrender conditions of World War I itself which really drove the rise of German fascism in the first place. The economy was trashed, land had been annexed, the reparations were crippling, homelessness and crime were rampant in the streets, Um, Berlin had basically become one big brothel. To put it mildly, the German people were in a fairly fragile, desperate state and were looking for anything to get them out of it. Given those conditions, it seems like some type of extreme political fascism, whether that was the Marxists or even the NS under a different leader like Goebbels, was the inevitable outcome of that socio-political environment. Uh, Not to mention that once the Nazis did get their foot in the political door, the hostile takeover from within the Chancellery and the subsequent suspension of democracy was decidedly undemocratic. But I don't really want to get too bogged down in the details of the Nazi rise to power. I think the most important thing to consider about the Nazi government here is that even if you want to argue that, rah rah, yay democracy, the German people voted for the NSDAP completely rationally, and that the socio economic environment they were living in at the time was completely irrelevant and had no external influence on their political decision at all you're still left with the undeniable fact that the rest of Europe, and the world for that matter, did not vote for Hitler. The things that happened as a result of that German election, which ultimately affected the whole of Europe, was far beyond the political reach of anyone else living outside the borders of Germany. The only option left for them was to simply pick up the pieces and fight back once Germany did start blitzkrieging their neighbours. You know... Between annexation and reparations, maybe the two nations fell victim to their own political hubris from decades prior, but as long as we're concerned with the democratic power and influence of individual citizens, ultimately neither the French nor the Polish people democratically voted for Hitler to invade them. Likewise, the British people did not vote for Hitler either. They had absolutely no democratic say in that 1933 German election, but nonetheless, they sure as shit had to deal with the consequences of that particular German government's actions. With that in mind, I want to look at the social and cultural fallout of these major events on the private lives of British people, who for the most part had no political control over these major events. Leading up to both world wars, we see a consistent rise in first marriages, 
troops marrying their sweethearts before being deployed to face almost certain death. Uh, This was followed by a dip in first marriages as the troops were in the field, and then another rise as the troops came home and married the sweethearts they'd left behind. The statistics for second marriages looks very different from first marriages. However, we still see an equally consistent trend across both wars. We see a plateau through the war, followed by a rise in second marriages after the war. Uh, Widows remarrying after finding out that their husbands were never coming home from the front line. Finally, we see a rise in divorce after World War II. Unfortunately, earlier divorce statistics are a little harder to find. This rise was probably a combination of unworkable marriages that were hastily rushed into by those aforementioned sweethearts who decided to marry before the husband was deployed, as well as a not insignificant number of men coming home from the front line to find their wives pregnant with other men's children. We see the same thing when we look at the American stats for World War II. Rise in marriage leading up to Pearl Harbor, drop in marriage during the war, rise in marriage at the end of the war, uh, rise in divorce after the war. The only info I could find on US remarriages is this old study from the US Census Bureau. The graph isn't great, but we still see remarriages rising to a peak that coincides with the end of the war. The consistency with which we see these social statistics fluctuate during both World War I and World War II shows us that the family unit, and specifically the individuals who make up that family unit, are naturally affected by environmental conditions, far more so than other factors such as targeted political policies like no-fault divorce or wingnut conspiracy theories about crypto-communist infiltration, you know, because the ghost of Karl Marx has nothing better to do with his time. In fact, it's worth noting that World War I finished four years before the formation of the USSR and almost a decade before communist China existed. Now, this is where we really get to the reason why I focused so heavily on the pill. I mean, there is no denying that other socioeconomic factors and events were affecting the choices of the individual family unit, war, depression, etc., The pill didn't happen in a socioeconomic vacuum, but I think there is something to be said for the scale of effect. Take US birth rates, for example. The pill is certainly not the only factor, not by a long shot. Um, Birth rates dropped during the Great Depression, they're back up during the post-war period. Clearly, other environmental factors were also at play. But look at what happens after the introduction of birth control. The birth rate drops lower and is sustained far longer than during the Great Depression. Same with both marriage and divorce rates. As we've just seen with the US and the UK, the world wars caused noticeable fluctuations on the institution of marriage, but the scale and consistent direction of the effect pales in comparison to the introduction of birth control. Consider this. Of the 5.3 million British infants delivered between 1939 and 1945, over a third were illegitimate. Um, This resulted in one of the only occurrences that I know of in the modern industrialised world where the two-to-one ratio of female-initiated divorce is flipped. Quote, The final 12 months of the war also saw a spectacular eightfold jump in the number of husbands who were suing for divorce on the grounds of adultery. By 1945, two out of every three petitions were being filed by men, whereas until 1940, female petitions had been in the majority. I mean, holy fucking shit. One in three children born illegitimate and two out of every three divorces being initiated by men. It's a world gone topsy-turvy. And yet, the UK divorce rate post-pill still peaks far higher and is sustained, well, indefinitely. You see, the medical separation of sex from reproduction was not simply an historical event. It was a paradigm shift to the human condition. No, the pill was not the only thing that was going on. Despite the impression you may have gotten, that has never actually been my position. But in trying to understand the broad strokes of why modern society has gone in the direction and taken the shape that it has, particularly regarding gender relations, 
birth control is pretty damn high up the list of important factors and influences that need to be closely scrutinized and understood. This innocuous little packet of 28 pills appears to have had a greater impact on our cultural institutions of family and reproduction than both world wars and the Great Depression combined. And that goes for welfare too. Perhaps it's entirely down to poor presentation on my part, but when I said that the pill caused our modern welfare problems, I didn't mean that the pill was the singular progenitor of welfare as a government institution. CS quite rightly points out in his video an alternative model for voter political influence and welfare state growth, that welfare in every wealthy industrialised nation was introduced before the pill. And indeed, that is evident in the graph that I used in my last video. Uh, we really see the beginning of US welfare in about 1935, basically in response to the Great Depression. And this is even more evident when we look at the type of welfare. You know, we kind of have a tendency to haphazardly throw around this general term, um, welfare this, welfare that, the welfare state, but there are different types of welfare and social spending. At the beginning of state welfare in the US, it was mainly work relief and household support, completely consistent with what a government would do when trying to alleviate the strain of an economic depression on its citizens. However, that obviously wasn't really what I was talking about when I spoke about the pill causing our welfare problems. I was quite obviously talking about this section of the graph. Certain people in my comment section really get quite upset when I imply that single motherhood came first and the growth of welfare followed. And I mean like really rage out upset. In, in their minds, I guess women are inherently evil parasites and welfare in and of itself incentivizes these amoral opportunistic succubi to get knocked up just for a taste of daddy government's child support money. The state is the so-called enabler of women and all of that. If that were the case, why didn't we see the blowout of single motherhood and welfare the second it was introduced in 1935? In fact, everything seems to be going just dandy for the first three decades. Now, that's not to say there has been no cross-contamination effect between welfare and reproduction. The growth of single mothers caused the growth of welfare expenditure, and in turn, welfare made it easier for women to be single mothers. I think there was definitely some kind of feedback loop between the two. But the reason I haven't focused on feedback loops as much as I've talked about the introduction of the pill is because a feedback loop on its own doesn't really explain us rapidly changing from this social trajectory to this one. Feedback in this part of the graph is all good and well. I don't disagree but something pretty fucking major had to change here to trigger that feedback loop in the first place. And before you mention it, it sure as shit wasn't a war on poverty. Such a thing did not exist in the UK or Australia, but look at what happens around about the same time in all three countries. Different countries, different politics and culture, different corners of the globe, Welfare actually introduced decades apart, and certainly no legislated war on poverty. You know what did happen to all of those countries around about the same time? The introduction of new technology into the medical market, specifically hormonal birth control technology. I mean, just looking at Australia for a second, we are, and clearly always have been, far more socialist than the UK and the US. As CS points out in his video, welfare was introduced here in some states as early as 1900. The pill clearly didn't cause this because it hadn't been invented yet, but whatever other factors did combine to cause this unusually high rate of pre-birth control welfare in Australia, our welfare spending in terms of GDP still almost doubled after the introduction of birth control. Even in an already established welfare-happy social democracy like Australia, the post-birth control shift in social spending is strikingly noticeable. CS is correct, the pill wasn't the original progenitor of welfare, but its effect on the already established institution of welfare, along with other already established institutions like legal marriage, represented something of a paradigm shift. And I think that's where a lot of the nuance in my position has either been lost or misconstrued. 
No, the pill was not some kind of Big Bang creation event, a point of singularity from which all else spread. Uh, The introduction of birth control didn't happen in an empty socioeconomic vacuum, and I never claimed it did. What the pill really represents is a reproductive paradigm shift at the end of a long chain of consecutive civilizational paradigm shifts. To really understand its place and to really understand the bigger picture of human civilization and its progression over time towards our current epoch, I think we have to go back a little further than the beginning of World War I. In the very beginning, and indeed for the vast majority of our evolutionary history, we were hunter-gatherers. If I had to use a few words to describe this, I would be using words like polygonous, tribal, communistic, nomadic, and subsistence. In a world of supermarkets overflowing with refrigerated goods, it's hard to even conceptualise that way of life. It literally seems like something from another dimension, and as a result, I'm really not sure some people truly get what a fundamental shift agriculture was to the evolved human condition. It is not an understatement to say that this was the very turning point of our species, not just in terms of our relationship to the natural environment, but also in terms of our relationship to each other. One of the great myths of the hunter-gatherer is the notion that they were natural conservationists. The truth about their nomadic or semi-nomadic way of life, however, was that they would move to an area, form a short-term settlement, strip it of every resource that was useful to them, and then move to a new area. You only owned what you could carry. To the extent that you did own anything, it was really collectively owned by the entire tribe. You know, you caught a kangaroo or whatever and refused to share that with the rest of the tribe. The penalty could be severe. Nature really is eat or be eaten. And a 50 to 60 person tribe living off the land mandated a shared resource and labor base just as a pragmatic reality of survival. The advent of agriculture changed all of that. It led to a much more sedentary existence, and this simple fact in itself allowed for the accumulation of resources. In other words, it led to the existence of wealth and trade-based living. Market economies formed, the division of labour increased, and eventually nation-states with standardised currencies grew from that. Rather than everyone being stuck in the same situation of subsistence and survival, A farmer could generate excess food and then trade some of that excess food for other goods and services. Say he generates enough food for 10 people. That's nine other people who could be doing other things. Aristotle couldn't sit around thinking all day if he had been stuck in a situation where everyone was scrounging in the bush just to find enough calories day to day for the tribe to survive. Now, this system of market economy trade and accumulated wealth also led to the formation of an age-old human institution that for the most part didn't exist in the world of hunter-gatherers. How do you get ahead in that system? The simple answer is, unfortunately, slavery. Essentially harnessing the labour of others to increase your own bargaining power within that market economy. Accumulation of resources and thus a need for slavery didn't exist in the subsistence living of hunter-gatherers. Whether this is good or bad could be argued. When tribes like the Yanomami go to war, nobody gets enslaved, they all just get slaughtered to the last man. You know, being dead versus being enslaved, we could argue which is worse, but it's kind of off topic. The amount that a single farmer can produce is still limited by his individual physical labour output. Say he can produce 10 units of labour, one he uses to feed himself, and nine of which he can trade or sell. A man who owns 10 slaves can produce 100 units of labour, 89 of which he can sell without ever having to lift a finger himself. Because of the relatively recent history of the United States, the issue of race often overtakes any reasonable discussion about what slavery really was. Accounts of the Thracians vary somewhat. Modern DNA analysis seems to indicate that they were genetically closer to you know, European Mediterraneans, However, most of the contemporary accounts describe them as having blue eyes and red hair. It is entirely possible that Spartacus, the most famous slave in history, was even more of a pasty white motherfucker than I am. Slavery certainly has had a racial component 
in certain places at certain times throughout history. But slavery as an institution has primarily been about economics, not race. All throughout antiquity, everyone was enslaving everyone else. As long as human civilization was dependent on human labor, the ability to harness human labor without having to compensate those people was the most efficient way for both individual elites and nation states to gain a competitive edge over their economic rivals. Then along came the Industrial Revolution. Suddenly, production was no longer intrinsically tied to manual labor. The first engine that James Watt patented for production in 1781 produced a continuous rotary output of 10 horsepower. One short century later in 1883, engines capable of outputting 10,000 horsepower were being produced. Just think about that for a second. 10,000 horses. The veritable power of Genghis Khan's horde army previously capable of sacking entire continents, was now being harnessed inside a single steam engine. Once again, the world had forever changed and the human condition changed along with it. 10,000 years of agriculture, 6,000 years of civilization, 2,000 years since Spartacus fought the Romans for his freedom. Then, less than 150 years ago, we have the American Civil War and the official end of antebellum slavery in the South. Does anyone here really think it's a coincidence that Abe Lincoln, the president credited with ending slavery in America, is also the very same president who built the Transcontinental Railroad? This is really not rocket science. The cheap labour of slavery was made obsolete by even cheaper mechanical labour. At the time slavery ended in the United States, these new mechanized engines now driving civilization were approaching the power of 10,000 horses. The days of owning other individuals as an economic labor commodity were done. And mechanization only got more efficient from there. Today, we are able to extract an estimated 23,200 man hours of energy and labor from a single barrel of oil. And even that may be coming to an end with new commercially viable vehicles like the Tesla, which can ostensibly be powered with nothing more than sunshine. This led to a situation where not only were slaves no longer viable in the economic marketplace, but mechanization became so efficient and was able to generate such an excess amount of wealth per capita that entirely new institutions of resource provisioning and social structure began to form in its wake. The paradigm of the human condition shifted once again. Which is where we get to the crux of CS's recent video. Just in case you didn't see the video, which I'd highly recommend watching, here's a quick recap. CS noted that in every industrialized nation, welfare was introduced some years before the pill. So the pill wasn't the initial cause of welfare as a state institution. He then looked at the contraceptive usage across South America and found that usage was fairly prevalent with rates above 70% for most of the continent. He then cross-referenced those contraceptive rates against a study that examined South American welfare rates, which showed two clearly distinct types of welfare countries. He ultimately concluded that it was not in fact the pill, but rather excess national wealth that leads to welfare. I think CS's theory and my own theory on welfare are in fact both correct. The mistake has been looking at them as either mutually exclusive issues or one encompassing the other, rather than separate but overlapping variables. So this section of the Venn diagram, the exclusive birth control set, is where the countries that CS was talking about live. Countries that do have birth control, but lack the necessary excess national wealth to support heavy welfare spending. This section of the Venn diagram, the exclusive national wealth set, is what I have been largely covering. Nations that were rich enough by GDP per capita to have welfare, but prior to the pill, prior to the sexual revolution, and thus prior to the single motherhood epidemic, didn't really experience what we would commonly call the welfare problem. And finally, this overlapping section here between the two sets is really the point at which CS's theory of welfare growth meets my own theory.
This overlap between birth control and excess national wealth is where the welfare problems we're concerned with really start to happen. CS's theory and my own theory are not actually in opposition to each other, they're in tandem. Now, with that, I think we come full circle to what I was talking about at the start of the video. I think that this Venn diagram is a pretty neat and tidy little explanation of humanity's long progression of changes in resource acquisition and trading leading up to the welfare state that we have today. The question is, how much more complicated do we really need to make this? I mean, should we add in the fact that the pill was dependent on the rise of modern medical science? I suppose we could jam the germ theory in there as well, even though it's completely irrelevant. CS's explanation included the fact that this excess national wealth is also highly correlated to the national average IQ. Of course, if we look hard enough, we can always find an exception to the rule like the UAE, who despite topping out at a national average IQ of 84, consistently find themselves in the top 10 wealthiest countries. This is because by the random chance of geography, they lucked into massive oil reserves. So I guess we need to add in natural resources to the diagram too. I mean, we could even zoom out and say that the industrial revolution couldn't have happened without metallurgy or more specifically the iron age. What steam engine was after all made from cast iron. Now our nice neat little explanation is really starting to look pretty fucking messy. So again, I ask the question, how much more complicated do we really want to make this? The topic of welfare and single mothers is primarily about our underlying models of resource provisioning, our reproductive framework, and the socio-political institutions that form as a result of those things. How much time do we really need to waste talking about the Iron Age? I mean, the Industrial Revolution was dependent on it, but is the development of metallurgy in and of itself relevant? Like, in the context of this discussion, did the ability to tool iron really represent as much of a fundamental paradigm shift to the human condition and our methods of survival and reproduction as, say, you know, the, the agrarian revolution and the way it fundamentally changed our resource dependency and thus our relationship to the natural environment? I mean, what about the Industrial Revolution and the way it fundamentally disassociated human labour from production? or the sexual revolution's disassociation of the innate instinctual drive for sex from the biological cost of reproduction. How much time do we really need to spend getting sidetracked arguing about whether the UAE in some way invalidates the overwhelmingly accurate generalization that increased national intelligence leads to increased national wealth? In fact, if we're being honest, it's not even that much of an exception when you look at the reason why. Were it not for the sheer dumb luck that the Arabian Peninsula contains massive oil reserves required by the higher IQ industrialized world, the UAE would probably be no better off economically than their goat herding neighbours in Yemen. And the same goes for the other so-called exceptions that people keep bringing up. The Japanese grass eaters, manamoni. None of these things are really exceptions to the rule when you think about it. I mean, the Japanese government still doesn't give a shit about men or their well-being. They only started peripherally addressing men's issues once it started looking like their non-participation would lead to a complete societal collapse. Inherently unjust alimony laws only get reviewed once they start affecting this new class of working women. They are not exceptions. They are the exact outcomes we'd expect when the observable model of gynocentric gender relations clashes with extenuating environmental circumstances. Pointing these things out is really no different to pointing out the UAE's oil reserves. It does nothing to actually invalidate the broadly accurate general model of gender relations, and it doesn't really give us any new insight into the matters being explored. All it does is waste time. And I think this Venn diagram also sheds some light on one of the other issues that I've copped an awful lot of flack for. You know, Coltane's a defeatist. But let's be frankly honest here. Human civilization viewed as a consecutive series of major paradigm shifts, each dependent on the last, represents something of a problem for any kind of quick, dirty solution. 
The fact is that some of these problems are damn near insurmountable in that the very developments which benefit us are the very same things that are causing our problems in the first place. We only get rid of one by getting rid of the other. Sedentary agrarian culture led to the growth of concentrated communicable diseases. Trade-based economies led to slavery. Mechanised labour led to mechanised warfare and killing. Excess national wealth led to welfare. Reproductive control led to relationship, family and social problems. We really can't move backwards from these paradigms and their inherent problems without also destroying everything good that we've built in the process. I mean, you want to pull the rug out from under state welfare? Well, that's great, but unfortunately, that rug is your robust Western economy. And aiming to tank the national economy just because you hate welfare mums would be cutting off your nose to spite your face. Not to mention that given our biological propensity to protect and provide for women, if your collapse fantasy did become a reality, then whatever institution is rebuilt, or should I say naturally forms in the wreckage, will probably have the exact same gynocentric outcomes as the current institution. The only way forward without burning it all to the ground and going back to subsistence living is through another major paradigm shift. I don't exactly know what form that will take, but I'm pretty damn sure that arguing against feminists on Facebook and calling it activism will prove tragically insufficient. Frankly, we probably require something on the same scale as a new industrial revolution to solve the problems of our current paradigm, but that's a topic for another time. I get why some people think that I'm a one-trick pony, and I get why others have lamented that my ideas aren't sophisticated enough for their tastes, presumably meaning that I don't leave enough wiggle room for their social constructivist solutions. You know, that, that they want you to donate to. I guess, I guess with your money, they can completely change deep-seated biological sex differences or something. Not everything is a result of the pill, and I'm aware of that. In fact, I'm hoping to mostly move on to other topics in future videos. I mean, honestly, these long-winded socioeconomic political history videos are fucking exhausting to make. But in the interest of getting to the main point... Some things are profound paradigm-shifting changes, and others just aren't relevant. Spending too much time faffing around on irrelevant exceptions, empty appeals to sophistication, and dreaming up pie-in-the-sky solutions that won't work doesn't get us any closer to a useful explanatory model. In the interest of focusing on what actually matters, I'll leave you with this. Several paradigm-shifting periods fundamentally changed the human condition, from subsistence hunter-gathering to agriculture and market economies to mechanised labour, ultimately leading us to a state of excess national wealth and reproductive control. And when those two things overlapped, we get a ballooning welfare state. Now, I'm not advocating that we should obsess over a single idea to the exclusion of all else, But in the interest of actually staying on topic and arriving at a useful and generally accurate understanding of the human condition, let's not go making this shit any more complicated than it really needs to be.